I'd like to thank David for those kind words and for the organizing committee of the book festival for inviting me here. Uh, this is the first time I've been on Martha's Vineyard. And in the 48 hours I've been here, I've had many intriguing experiences. Um, in the interest of providing you with, I don't know about intriguing, but at least interesting experience, I'm not going to read from my book. I'm going to talk a little bit about it instead. Uh, and I guess the theme for this uh, little talk will be Karl Marx, the familiar and the unfamiliar. Now, we all know about the familiar Karl Marx. He's the dude with the big beard. He's the author of the Communist Manifesto and Das Kapital. He's the patron saint of the 20th century communist regimes, now mostly defunct. Um, but I'd like to talk a little bit about an unfamiliar Karl Marx um, in his 19th century context, and I'll do this in three parts. Marx the journalist, Marx the Protestant, and Marx the economist. So let's talk about the unfamiliar Karl Marx, and we'll start with Marx the journalist. Um, when Marx was, had to fill out official forms listing his occupation, he usually wrote in doctor of philosophy, which is not an occupation. If we ask what he did for a living and how he spent most of his time, the answer is he was a journalist. He spent 20 years being a journalist, an active and energetic one. He edited two major newspapers, the Heinische Zeitung, or Rhineland News in Cologne, 1842-43, its successor, the Neue Heinische Zeitung, the New Rhineland News, in Cologne in 1848-1849 during the Revolution. He edited a number of smaller papers and magazines, a lot of editorial projects. This was a major part of his um, occupational political life. Marx was also wrote as a freelance journalist. He wrote for at least 11 different newspapers in the German states, in Austria, in England, um, in South Africa, and above all in the United States for most of the decade of the 1850s. He was the European correspondent for the New York Tribune, then the world's largest newspaper. Marx wrote enormously and extensively for the Tribune. The extent of his journalism, particularly for the Tribune, is not often acknowledged. Um, his good friend and close political associate, Friedrich Engels, and his speech at Marx's graveside in 1883 emphasized Marx as a journalist, and rightly so. Marx wrote or was assigned over 400 articles for the New York Tribune. Maybe a quarter were actually ghostwritten by Engels but there was still an enormous amount. These articles are gigantic. When they're republished today, they run five to 10 pages. Uh, Marx was really more, I think we might say, a columnist than a reporter, if we use today's parlance. The volume of his writing for the New York Tribune is greater than everything else he published in his life put together. Enormous volume of very interesting material. And I, Interesting um, in that it allowed Marx to try out ideas. Many of the things that we find in Marx's canonical writings, like Das Kapital, um, other things he wrote, were first tried out as newspaper articles for the Tribune. And very often, uh, he wrote about everything, um, very often I think we find stuff which is way more interesting there than in the official canonical publications. Uh, I could talk for you know, several days about this, but let me just give you one example, and this concerns something we all know about the familiar Marx. He was the guy who wrote about the crisis of capitalism. And in Das Kapital, both the one published volume and the two volumes that appeared after his death and Engels editing his notes, there are lots of different explanations of why capitalism periodically, in and of itself, uh, develops into difficult circumstances. Uh, none of those, they're not very, they don't always agree with each other. They're often not very convincing. In 1858, Marx wrote a very interesting newspaper piece from the New York Tribune about this. He was writing in the wake of the crisis of 1857, the very first worldwide recession. Uh, and Marx was writing about a French bank, the Crédit Mobilier. Crédit Mobilier is a very interesting bank. It was the world's first iBank. It um, sponsored IPOs for French and actually broadly European railroad companies and industrial concerns. It would have been particularly steel mills back then. Um, and um, Marx noted, and this just absolutely horrified him, that the statutes of the Crédit Mobilier enabled them to borrow nine times their capital. So as we'd say today, they were leveraged up. And Marx said, look, he said, what's going to happen? Uh, they borrow this, all this money, and they, 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 um, 
They do it for IPOs and they buy stock shares in the Paris Force. They expand in this way. They're going to expand enormously industrial production in France and throughout Europe. And indeed, they're going to expand it beyond what the market can, can absorb. And the result of this is going to be this flood of um, unsold products. There will be a crisis and a recession. But the Crédit Mobilier, having borrowed all this money, being all leveraged up, um, now has its assets in stock shares, which have fallen in value and are not liquid, and it can't repay its debts. And so, you know, this is really how capitalist crises work. And when we think about 2008, and if we replace the Crédit Mobilier with Lehman Brothers, and we replace French uh, industrial and railroad corporations with um, Riverside County and Las Vegas real estate, we have, in fact, a very good picture of something about the most recent global financial crisis. Uh, this is a good example of Marx using his newspaper articles to think about the world in ways that are still sort of interesting today. And just as a footnote to this comment, a couple of weeks ago I was reading in the Financial Times that the Deutsche Bank, Germany and Europe's leading bank, has decided it's gotten over leveraged. And so it wants to reduce its leverage to a mere 33 to 1. So Marx was all upset about a quarter as much as so he really didn't understand what capitalists could do. All right, so that's Marx using journalism to try out his ideas, but there's another piece of Marx. Journalism was his main form of political engagement. He began his political career in 1843 when he became the editor, or the act, technically actually the acting editor of the Rheinische Zeitung. Um, during the revolution of 1848, he was the editor of its successor, the Neue Rheinische Zeitung, enormously influential newspaper in the revolution, particularly in Western Germany, but across Central Europe. Uh, viciously attacking the Prussian government, its officials, its soldiers, its royal family, stirring things up. Um, Marx, um, in fact, as late as the early 1860s, when Marx was attempting a political comeback after the suppression of the 1848 revolution, his immediate plans were to start editing another newspaper, the third version of the Heinische Zeitung, which would come out in Berlin. Uh, it fell through for various reasons, but what we can see is somebody whose political commitment lay through journalism. Now, there were other forms of political commitment. Marx was, of course, a member of the famous Communist League for which he wrote the Manifesto. He was a member of the Democratic Society in Cologne during the Revolution of 1848. He um, was a member, indeed a dominant figure, in the, provincial in the directory of the Provincial Federation of Democratic Clubs in the Western Provinces of Prussia. Um, he did all those things, but it must be said that it was above all in journalism that he was politically active and successful. Uh, Marx, in fact, dissolved the Communist League in 1848, uh, later revived it following the suppression of the revolution, but he got expelled from it because he alienated most of the members. Uh, he did a lot with the democratic clubs, but he was often accused, and I think rightly so, of neglecting them for his newspaper. He and his supporters were known as the party of the New Rhineland News. It was through the newspaper that he was really at his most politically active. And indeed, following the failure of the Revolution of 1848, Marx's forced flight into exile in London, and his basically alienating, he and Engels alienating most of the political refugees in London, he wrote to Engels in 1851, I've had it with political parties. I'm sick of being insulted by every party jackass. I'm not doing this anymore. Concentrate his political career exclusively on journalism. Did that. And, and there is, of course, in 1864, he changed his mind. Um, he went to a meeting which was about denouncing the Tsar of Russia. Uh, one of more, and it's ironic for the guy who is the patron saint of the Russian Revolution. Marx hated Russia. Uh, a revolutionary war against Russia was central to his thinking about the world. And he was at this meeting uh, denouncing the Tsar of Russia and the Tsar's suppression of the Polish nationalist uprising of 1863. And he saw this as a interestingly enough, as an opportunity to become politically active again in the, what would become the newly founded International Working Men's Association, the first international, which is usually associated very closely with Marx. Um, he wrote, uh, as he made this decision, to one of his old followers, a man named Josef Weidemeyer, who was by then living in St. Louis, Missouri. And he said, you know, um, you understand this is a, a big change. I haven't done this in a long time. I don't really like political parties, but this is an opportunity that I can't pass up. And he did, for the next eight or nine years, become the leading figure in the International Working Men's Association until he actually dissolved it in 1872-73. Uh, and in the last decade of his life, Marx was in very poor health, basically an invalid, was no longer able to return to journalism. But I think we really ought to understand 
that journalism was Marx's main form of political engagement. It was also, I think many of his interesting ideas came out best in journalism. He was, in many ways, a short-form writer. His most interesting pieces, like Communist Manifesto, the 18th Brumaire, are short-form pieces, often designed for journalism, his newspaper articles. He wrote a lot of long-form stuff, these philosophical treaties in the 1840s, his enormous work on capitalist economic system. He never finished any of them. Um, he was not a guy who was good at completing things. Um, and, and in many ways, I think Marx is best understood and is most effective as a short-form journalistic type author. So that's Marx the journalist. Now let me turn to something which I think people will find a little peculiar, the idea of Marx the Protestant. Because everybody knows Marx is a Jew, the descendant of a long line of rabbis, an Old Testament prophet. If I had a nickel for every time I'd read those lines by different authors, I wouldn't need the royalties on this book. I would be a wealthy man. So that's the, what everybody knows about Marx. The problem is it's not really the case. Marx was descended from a long line of rabbis, well, till his grandmother. His father, Heinrich, or sometimes Heschel or Henri at different points in his life, was not a rabbi at all, but a lawyer, an attorney. Uh, a secular legal education, Heinrich Marx was an adherent of the Enlightenment. Uh, Marx told his youngest daughter, Eleanor, uh, reminiscing about his youth, that his father used to read Voltaire to him. Um, at Heinrich's death in 1838, as required by the Napoleonic Code, a notary went through his possessions and listed all of them. There's a complete list of all of Heinrich's books. They're mostly law books, as you might expect from an attorney, but there's also a copy of Thomas Paine's The Rights of Man. Uh, so he's an adherent of the Enlightenment, and it was this fact that was an adherent of the Enlightenment that led Heinrich Marx to become a Protestant, uh, which he did probably around 1819, um, the Prussian government had decided that Jews would not be allowed to practice law, that not be allowed to be public officials, and they included in the ranks of public officials, attorneys, and private practice. Heinrich Marx did have to become a Christian if he wanted to continue with his job and educate his family. But unlike many of the old Jewish families in the southwestern German city of Trier, who by 1830 had been converted to Christianity, almost all had become ca uh, Catholic, Trier was and is an immensely Catholic city, uh, where Protestants were almost as weird as Jews, um, Heinrich Marx became a, a Protestant, and that was because Protestant, a very strong strain of Protestantism in Germany at that time saw Protestant religion and Christian religion as going along with the ideas of enlightenment, of deism, natural religion, of rationalism, Unitarianism, and that became Heinrich Marx's Christianity of choice. Um, his children were baptized. I should add, while I was working on this book, my editor at Norton, Bob Weil, who's really into Jewish interests, kept telling me, tell us about Marx's Jewish past. How about his bar mitzvah and his Passover status? Bob, he was baptized at the age of five. He didn't have any of those. Um, and indeed, he enjoyed a Christian religious education. The very first preserved piece of Karl Marx's writings, his high school graduation exam in his religion class, which is an interpretation of a passage of the Gospel according to St. John. So Marx was, in fact, shaped as a Protestant, as a liberal, enlightened German Protestant of the early years, uh, first half of the 19th century. Um, the shaping as a Protestant, I think it's fair to say, was very important for the origins of some of Marx's theories, um, in particular for his relationship to the ideas of the famous philosopher Hegel. Uh, Marx first found out about Hegel's ideas when in 1837 he became a student at the University of Berlin. Uh, Hegel had been dead for six years. He died in the great cholera epidemic of 1831. But a group of his followers, whom contemporaries called the Young Hegelians, uh, people that became Marx's friends, associates, intellectual interpreters of the legacy of Hegel. Um, the most important of these, in my opinion, was a man named Bruno Bauer. But Bauer, like other of the young Hegelians, you may have heard of a man named Ludwig Feuerbach, who's often seen as a crucial influence on Marx. I think that's exaggerated. Another important figure, Arnold Ruge, and indeed all the young Hegelians, every one of them was a Protestant theologian. They were all Protestant theologians, and they all had a very interesting intellectual development. They did, as Hegel's followers did, they applied the master's dialectical methods to various academic disciplines. And this was the in thing to do in Germany in the 1830s and 1840s. They applied Hegel's 
academic disciplines to the study of theology, in particular what we today call the higher criticism of the Bible, the effort to ascertain what is the truth in the Old and New Testament accounts of ancient Palestine. And they did this as good Protestants, as trying to purge the Bible of all its accretions and go back to the original teachings. Um, but what happened, and this is, um, was the, what they did at acting as good Protestants, they all ended up as atheists because once they'd applied Hegel's methods to purge the Bible, there was nothing, there were no, there was nothing left. They were all, they, they argued that these were, uh, all the, the story, all the story, biblical stories were in fact uh, the product of the alienation of the human self-consciousness and the self-group consciousness of the Jews of ancient Palestine, uh, human species essence into an imaginary divinity. And so their effort to find the truth of the Bible led them to become atheists. This was really unfortunate for their careers. Bruno Bauer, Professor Bruno Bauer wanted to be appointed a professor of Protestant theology at a Prussian university while planning to edit a, a journal to be called the Archives of Atheism. Now, actually, today, this would not be at all impossible for a German professor of Protestant theology to be an atheist. And you German Protestant and Protestant pastors are. But of course, you couldn't really do this in the 1840s, especially after the new king, a man named Friedrich Wilhelm IV, came to the throne, an adherent of what they call the uh, awakening, very much like today's evangelical Christianity. The new king was a born-again Christian and was not entranced by the idea of having one of his professors of Protestant theology be an atheist. Bauer lost his job. And Bauer, who was Marx's patron, Marx lost his chance for an academic career uh, as a philosopher and theologian, which is what he'd been planning to do. And that was how he, needing work, he edited, became the acting editor of the Heinrichs Zeitung, and got involved in politics. But there's more to that, because Marx did something very interesting. He took the young Hegelian's ideas about human alienation, this idea that you take human self-consciousness, the human species essence, and you import it, you make it into an object, an alien from you, and it's an imaginary divinity. And he applied that to economics, and he said in capitalism, uh, this is what happens. Workers take their own labor and their labor power on the objects they make, and they become uh, objects in circulation and capital. They are owned by capitalists. They are alien to workers and dominate, uh, dominant over them. And this is one of the beginnings of Marx's theories of economics involved taking, this is very much the Hegelian political program, taking Hegel's um, theological ideas and applying them to the science of political economy. And so we can really say in many ways that Marx's, um, Marx's basic economic principles and his basic way of looking at the world were the result of 19th century or early 19th century German liberal Protestant theology. Uh, Marx was profoundly influenced by Protestant theology. Marx, the Old Testament prophet, um, the last course Marx took at the University of Berlin for which he was registered were Bruno Bauer's lectures on Isaiah. So that's where Marx became an Old Testament prophet from listening to Protestant theologians. Now you might wonder, having said this, how it is that we all think of Marx as Jewish. And the answer is Marx became Jewish largely in retrospect. In the last, in most of Marx, for most of Marx's life, being Jewish was a matter of religious and cultural affiliations. Marx, who was baptized, Protestant, although of course like all the young Hegelians, it became, went from being a Protestant to being an atheist, um, who um, was not terribly interested in Jewish culture and uh, was very much involved in mainstream German cultural and intellectual and political life. Uh, didn't appear as very Jewish. Um, and a lot of contemporaries that I mentioned, well, he's a guy of Jewish descent, but he's also not, you know, this is not a big emphasis because this was not how people thought of Jews. In the last decade of Marx's life, a new development appeared, a new image of Jews, um, a result of the ideas of Charles Darwin uh, and the application of his theories of evolution to human society. And this involved perceiving Jews as a group of common, unalterable biological descent as a race. And uh, people who are hostile to Jews come up with a new way to describe this. They called, them an they, they called their ideas anti-Semitism, uh, the idea being to apply to Jews as a group of biological racial descent. We often talk about anti-Semitism as being religiously based hostility to Jews, but that was actually very different. Uh, and in the last decade of Marx's life, as this point of view became more and more common, people began to think of Marx in terms of his descent and his physical features and uh, newspaper interviews that appeared with him in the last decade of his life when he'd become something of a celebrity, would always describe his Semitic features, Semitic is the word here, Semitic features, uh, the, um, 
in the various obituaries that appeared, he would often be described as, um, as being um, a, a, a Semitic and of Jewish descent, although due to an, a somewhat odd, um, an odd um, error, his father was described as being an official of the Prussian State Tsar Basin Mining Corporations, which is about the most Gentile occupation imaginable. Um, but so what we see, um, Marx really became Jewish in retrospect. And, and, you know, and in the 19th and 20th centuries, as his ideas developed worldwide credence and right-wing groups became increasingly anti-Semitic, they identified the founder of communism with Jews. And the Jews themselves, especially in the Russian Empire and Eastern Europe, became involved in politics and often accepted these ideas. They were part of a race. They saw Marx as one of their own, as like this Jewish folk hero. Uh, although really, was, Marx was not somebody who particularly cared for Jews and made a number of very nasty remarks about them, was not part of Jewish culture. And well, as I said, had been brought up and really shaped as a Protestant. All right, now let me turn um, to the third and, oh, I've got, I've got a surprising amount of time here. All right, I'll see if we can do this. Um, and the third and final part of Marx's, uh, the unfamiliar Marx is Marx as an economist. Now, um, today when people think of Marx as an economist, you really fall into two groups. There's sort of the orthodox economists who say, oh, this stuff is unscientific, it's nonsense. Marxists don't know calculus, they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, then there are the, the adherents of Marx who say, oh, it's, it's these orthodox economists who don't know what they're talking about. And like 2008 shows they're all, their, all their theories of um, general equilibrium and um, rational expectations and um, rational markets are in fact wrong. Marx is the sort of, art, the sort of patron saint of unorthodox economists. Uh, and so that Marx, one might say, often one sees him rhetorically opposed to, say, Adam Smith, the guru of the free market and the individual hand. Now, what's fascinating about Marx as an economist is that he was enormously impressed by Adam Smith. He was a big fan of Smith and admired him greatly. Marx was particularly impressed by a man named David Ricardo, uh, a figure, if he's known at all today, it's for his theory of comparative advantage, which involved applying Smith's doctrines of the division of labor to international trade, uh, sort of a bit of an obscure figure. In Marx's day, he was Smith's chief and leading disciple, a towering intellectual figure. Marx admired Ricardo greatly, describing him as the greatest economist of the 19th century. All of Marx's central ideas about economics, the labor theory of value, the idea of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall, the idea um, that over time surplus value accumulates in the hands of land-owning capitalists, the form of ground rent, these are all basic tenets taken from Ricardo. Marx did not desire to overturn the orthodox economists of his day. Rather, he sought to improve their work, bring out what he saw as the consequences they themselves had not thought of, to by applying Hegel's methods to them. Marx was very much an orthodox 19th century economist who believed that his ideas were the logical consequence of the mainstream economics of his day. Marx often denounced socialist economists who argued the orthodox economists were wrong. Um, his most fa famous uh, polemic against Proudhon, the poverty of philosophy, was accusing the French socialist. He's today thought of as an anarchist, but contemporaries saw him as a socialist. <laughs> Um, I read this thing, Proudhon is a nitwit who doesn't understand uh, Ricardo's basic economics. So one might ask, you know, in a lot of ways that Marx is the unorthodox economist is like uh, Marx is the Jew. It was something that happened uh, at the end of his life and after his death, and how is this possible? The answer is in the 1870s, economics changed enormously. There are new theory developed, uh, marginal utility theory, uh, sometimes called neoclassical economics, which asked fundamentally different questions from the questions that the classical economists Smith, um, Ricardo, James and John Stuart Mill, um, Malthus and Say asked. Uh, economics changed, changed completely. And one of the ways we know it is it changed its name. It was formerly political economy. It then became economics, developed the use of calculus and those supply and demand curves and market equilibria. Marx knew about this stuff. And um, in the last decade of his life was studying calculus so that he could like integrate this into his, uh, it's actually interesting, he often used or tried to use algebraic equations in his work, his math was pretty terrible, so he had trouble with this. Um, he was interested in this, but 
never, his, his health was declining. He was never able to really deal with confront, confrontation with this new form of economics. By the time Marx became known, um, a decade after his death, when Engels had completed all three volumes of Capital from Marx's notes, his incomplete manuscripts, all written in his horrible handwriting. Um, Neoclassical economics had carried the day. It was the dominant form of economics. Neoclassical economists like to pretend they had a line of descent from Adam Smith. They like mostly by quoting Smith's comments about the invisible hand, invariably out of context. Um, economics had become fundamentally different, and Marx, the um, Marx, the um, Marx, the, the orthodox economist, had become because. His economic orthodoxy was now out of date, had become unorthodox and dissenting. And I will just note that I was nicely put up here um, on a street. I noticed that um, the neighbor of the folks who were so nicely hosting me is Robert Solow, one of the great neoclassical economists of the um, second half of the 20th century, the development of neoclassical growth theory. Uh, and indeed, all economists today, whether they're the Chicago School or the, 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 um, the Paul Krugman uh, Joseph Stiglitz, a dissenting economist, they're all descendants of neoclassical economics via Keynes. Uh, and so everybody today, except for a few diehard Marxists, is a neoclassical economist. And that's why Marx, in fact, is no longer, no longer, a, uh, an, economic, no longer an orthodox economist. He became one quite unintentionally. Uh, so that's, that's some of the unfamiliar Marx that I can talk about uh, for you. And uh, uh, there's a lot more I could I know I'll tell you to read the book if you want to read more about the unfamiliar Marx. It's what led me to conclude, in many ways, Marx is a figure of a past historical era. Um, to be sure, a lot of things about Marx still are relevant today. But in a lot of ways, he's best understood as a figure of a 19th century. Uh, I've been studying the 19th century for a long time. And the more I do, the more I'm convinced it's a period very different from our own. Uh, which is what led me to write this book and do it in this way. So thank you for listening so politely to my random. On the question of his anti-Semitism, uh, on the question of anti-Semitism, yeah. uh, there's this piece he wrote. Is it called On the Jewish yes, there is. Question? Jew I've forgotten. Um, in which he speaks of Jews in a way that now yeah. would be considered very anti-Semitic. Right, so well, how, what do you make of all, all right. of that? Um, I, 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 um, I, don't know, I didn't have time to do this in the talk, but about on the Jewish question, which is actually in response to an essay that Bruno Bauer wrote about Jewish question. And this has to do with the way that liberal Protestant theologians devised ideas hostile to Jews. In traditional Protestant or Catholic theology, it said Jews are rotten and bad because they're not Christians. They don't believe in the divinity of Christ. They're condemned to hell. Um, liberal Protestant theologians couldn't say that because they didn't believe in the divinity of Christ either. Um, and what they said instead was that Judaism is an ethically inferior religion. It's a religion which is particularist and self-interested, only open to the chosen people and not to all of humanity. It's a religion uh, which expresses itself via these various ritual acts rather than through ethical consideration and moral, moral decision making as Christianity inspires people to do. People who are hostile to the Jews would go on to say, this appears in their economic behavior. Jews are self-interested, they're greedy, um, they cheat people, uh, they rob them, uh, generally in a sophistic fashion. Um, and Marx, in, on the Jewish question, in criticizing capitalism, said, well, that's exactly how capitalists act, and it's because that's how Jews act, and the Jewish spirit has permeated all of capitalist society. It's an example of Marx taking these ideas of liberal Protestant theology and applying them to economics. That's where it comes from. Now, of course, you read it in the light of 20th century anti-Semitism of the Nazis' final solution to the Jewish question, the persecution of the Jews in the Soviet Union, and it's really creepy stuff to read. But if we look at it in the light of liberal Protestant, and I might add, by the way, that German liberal Protestant theologians continue to look at Judaism as a religion in that way down into the 1960s. Um, we look at it in that light. We, it's, still, it's still rather unpleasant reading, but it doesn't have quite some of that same 20th century creepiness to it. I hope that answers your question. Could you comment on Pope Pius's performance in, uh, or behavior in, during World War II? Uh, as you know, before he became Pope in 39, yeah. he lived in Germany for many right. years, so he knew Germany well. And did he demonstrate uh, 
courageous leadership, or was he just oh, a, right. was, was he, he just a quiet to, accomplice? Does he want me to jump into this one? All right. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I'll just say this about Pius the Twelfth. I'll leave it at that. Um, and during the Nazi occupation of Poland, the regime, not just the Jews there, of course, they were all killed, but the Polish people were viciously persecuted by the Nazis. Hundreds and maybe even thousands of priests were sent to concentration camps and shot. Population was treated like, uh, was enslaved, uh, suppressed, uh, and the Pope made no response to the persecution of the Poles who were deeply devout Catholics. He felt, um, that the best way to deal with this, it's not like he was pro-Nazi in any way, shape, or form, very difficult to be if you're a devout, extremely devout Christian, as Pius XII was. Uh, he felt the best way to deal with this was to use inside channels, um, not to make a big public stink about it, that would just enrage the Nazis even more. Given he felt that way about good Catholics, why would you expect him to do anything for Jews? That's my answer to your question about Pius XII. What, you know, one of the things about, about Marx is the breadth of, of his life's work is so extraordinary that many fields in, uh, today claim roots yeah. in, in what he's done. And historians, you know, the work right. he did in the British Museum on the primitive accumulation of capital, yeah. um, on Jewish question, many right. structuralists think of as a, a, a landmark. What, so depending on who you talk to, there's an entirely different thinker uh, that, they, that they identify with. Right. What did he think his most important work was, um, you know, given the breadth of right. that, what that, he primitive, did. that primitive accumulation stuff, which by the way is badly translated from German and is better known as primal or original accumulation, was by the way stuff he first thought about as a correspondent for the New York Tribune, uh, writing about British rule in India, just as a sideline here. Marx himself, I think, would have said two things about his thought. One was that he had found, uh, he had figured out these ideas of classical economics that Smith and especially Ricardo, he had figured out exactly what was going on with things they were groping towards, and he had uncovered how these were inevitably going to lead to the end of capitalism. The second thing he would have said is that he had found ways to apply Hegel's dialectical methods to the study of human society. Now, this is tricky because in the middle of Marx's life, all these new ideas emerged, what we today call positivism, the authority of the natural sciences. Marx, like all his contemporaries, read Charles Darwin and was very impressed. Um, Engels it was an enormous fan of Darwin. And when Engel, Engels, Engels, in his speech to Marx's graveside and his writings about Marx, um, which is how most people knew about Marx, would describe Marx as the Charles Darwin of the, um, the human social world. Um, Marx himself was a bit more ambivalent about Darwin and tried to reconcile Darwin with Hegel, which was a difficult task and one of his many unfinished philosophical efforts. But with those two things, I think that Marx would have seen as his major intellectual contributions. Could you talk a little bit about Marx as a person, as a human being, yeah. what did he do in his spare time? Right. Did he have a sense of humor? Yeah, yeah, yeah no, he did have a sense of humor. Uh, Marx was, was um, all right, uh, uh, let, me see, let me do two things. Marx was an educated German of the 19th century. He'd been to the gymnasium, um, the college preparatory secondary school, where the main topic of instruction was Greek. He relaxed by reading Greek authors in the original. Uh, that sort of guy. He was interested in literature, he, uh, Goethe, but also Cervantes, um, Shakespeare, all of the classics. He was interested in realist novels, especially in Balzac. Um, so he had that very much that high culture, 19th century um, German educated bourgeois high culture thing. That was very much part of his life. Unlike 20th century leftist, popular culture did not interest him much. Um, the other thing about Marx, I say that he was very much a loving husband and father. He was a 19th century bourgeois pater familius. This, of course, led to the famous incident where he had the illegitimate child with the maid. Um, but he was also very much a loving husband, um, deeply devoted to his children, an enormous tragedy. Four of them died uh, before they grew up. The death of his son, Edgar, at the age of eight in 1855, probably from a ruptured appendix, uh, was by far the greatest tragedy in Marx's life and just left him depressed for years and years and years. Horrible event. Uh, Marx had only three daughters who grew to adulthood. He wanted them to be proper young ladies. They studied French and Italian, took piano lessons, 
Marx, who didn't have much money, nonetheless made it a priority to make his daughters that way. Um, they would be good like his wife, be good wives, supportive. But, and this is, um, as bourgeois paterfamilias' goal, he was in the Victorian era, he was actually quite progressive. His daughters went to secondary school. There were only a thousand girls in all of London in secondary school in the 1860s. Three of them were Marx's daughters. So he wanted his daughters to be wives and supporters of their husband, but also to appreciate their politics, to support them, to be active. And indeed, his oldest daughter, Jenny, was his secretary. Um, and as a journalist in her own right, she was a big fan of Irish nationalism and wrote at some length about the Fenians. Um, so that was, those were, I think, you know, the, 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 very, the very bourgeois uh, cultural guy, but also the, the deeply devoted, loving husband and father, in spite of the weird thing that he made. Um, I, I, it's a fascinating story, you know. Uh, yeah. Thank okay. you very much, Professor Sperber. If you have questions, Professor Sperber will be at the 10th.